Good evening and welcome to Conroy Goodwin University College and the Rod and Lorna Sawatsky Visiting Scholar Lecture. We're very pleased to have you here. I welcome you on behalf of our college president, Susan Schultz Huxman, my faculty colleagues. We're glad you joined us this evening. This lecture honors the legacy and the contributions of Rod and Lorna Sawatsky to this college, to the University of Waterloo, and to this community. Rod Sawatsky joined the college in 1974. He taught history, Mennonite studies, religious studies, peace and conflict studies. He was dean from 1974 to 1989 and president from 1989 to 1994. He was then president of Messiah College in Pennsylvania until 2004, shortly before his death. Lorna is here tonight. She lives in this community. She's an active member of this community. We're glad to welcome you, Lorna, and know that you traveled a good bit to arrive here. She was uh, less than 24 hours ago at some uh, at a reunion in California, and it was a bit of a temperature shock to arrive back. <laughs> Lorna, good to have you back with us for this day. Thanks for your interest in this program, for your interest in the college, and for all the contributions. Rod and Lorna had a significant and lasting influence on this college, on the university, and on this region. We honor them by bringing in distinguished visiting scholars to speak about their areas of research. Scholars who made a significant contribution, who reflect a kind of ecumenical, broad-minded spirit, who build bridges and foster reconciliation in the world who embody the complementary relationship between the church and the university that this college represents. We have an endowment that sustains this lectureship series and enables us to bring these people here, people who are speakers, lecturers, gifted artists, passionate advocates. They come into our classrooms and offer this lecture. Carol Muller, for example, who is here today, has already been in several classes, had lunch conversations with faculty and students, a series of other informal conversations, and that's the wonderful gift that this lectureship is to this community. Well, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Carol Muller. She's an ethnomusicologist from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. While she's been on campus this week, we've learned to know not only about her professional work, but her interests in the community and something about her own family life. We've enjoyed it very much. We're glad to have you here. I'm going to invite now my colleague, Carol Weaver, to introduce Carol Muller to you. Carol was a colleague who knew of Carol Muller's work, who encouraged us to invite her. We're very, very pleased that we did that. After the lecture, we're going to have a brief question and answer period, and then we'll invite you to the dining room for a reception. So, Carol, my colleague, please. <coughs> Having been in Africa a bunch of times, I started going to international conferences, uh, ethnomusicology, and I, I could hardly walk in the door. People would see my name tags, and they start complimenting me on my work. I was very flattered. <laughs> and so I took it all in because I knew it wasn't going to last. And of course, they had the last name wrong. They had Carol Ann Muller in mind, not Carol Ann Weaver. <laughs> so uh, I just want to tell you, many of you are grateful that I'm here to share those tidings. <laughs> Ms. Carol Ann Muller uh, grew up in the Cape. And uh, unlike many people of her ilk and background, she decided that to see the real Africa was, was a mission for her to accomplish. And so zealously, she snuck off to the forbidden township areas to learn gumboot dancing, which she so aptly demonstrated. I was one of her most left-footed uh, uh, members of the, the, the group here uh, two days ago in Macy Sun's class. Uh, Carol Muller uh, then, with the desire to follow her insatiable curiosity about music, culture, and the many societies which are uh, alive and well in South Africa today. So after receiving an honors in music degree from KZN, which is University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa, she applied and was accepted on a full scholarship 
to study musicology at New York University. Uh, she informed us yesterday that she thinks she got that partly because she could do the gum boot. Uh, so here's a white woman who could do gum boot. Uh, you can't get much better. And from there, she completed her PhD, and uh, then the rest is history. She's been publishing for years. Uh, I have her one fat book, uh, which is one of the tomes of South African music. It's literally called Music of South Africa, along with a recording that goes with it. Uh, she's written on, uh, along with Satomea uh, Bea Benjamin, the uh, musical echoes, South African women thinking in jazz. Also, very provocative topics, rituals and for, of fertility and the sacrifice of desire, Nazarite women's performance in South Africa. Each topic is just more bizarre and more uh, fascinating than the one before. I shouldn't say bizarre, more fascinating. <laughs> uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania has claimed her for the moment, and uh, she teaches both grad and undergrad students online, um, hands-on uh, inter uh, connections with community centers. Her week here at Grable has already been vivid. She had the show-a-thon, tell-a-thon, teach-a-thon, uh, gumboot dance class that, uh, as I mentioned, many of us have many more left feet than we thought. She also, uh, the next night, lectured on the Fosan, the Bushman of the Kalahari, and handily, I must say, and how that connects to jazz. Then uh, the next day, she came to another class and talked about the Zimbabwean Mbiru, which is a thumb piano, equally handily, and, and mentioned some of the uh, people who do it today. And um, then today, did she not talk about uh, um, African-American music in her own town now, Philadelphia, both the Muslim people and the gospel world. So tonight, she will lecture on the life and music of internationally acclaimed South African singer, Satima uh, Bia Benjamin. And uh, we look forward to hearing how this particular woman's story helps tell the story of South Africa. Thank you very much for coming here. Intruders, we witness a moment of encounter captured in a photographic image on the slip cover of a compact disc titled A Morning in Paris. Taken many years earlier and made public for the first time in 1997, the close up in black and white of the two faces exudes a feeling of familiarity, even intimacy in the way in which the eyes interlock. These are two unlikely subjects a young woman of ambiguous racial marking and an older man in a brightly lit public space. He occupies the left of the frame, she the right. Pos positioned like intruders, we the viewers see only one side of their faces. The partial shadow that covers the man's cheeks darkens his complexion, and then we notice the detail in the hair. This is definitely a man of African descent. His ear catches our attention. It is poised to hear. The light casts their shadow on the woman's countenance, dark, straight hair with deliberate curl, fine features, and distinctive eyebrows. We give a few clues about the nature of the encounter between these two people. Her head is tilted up towards his. He tenderly returns the gaze. The mouths of both are slightly open. Neither seems to speak except perhaps in whispered tones. The woman's imprint, her handwriting, is superimposed in white on the mechanically reproduced title in indigo, white, and red. Satima B. Benjamin, A Morning in Paris. A block of the city skyline underscores the text. A European city, a woman's name, Satima. Not recognizably European, but no further clues about origins or community. Snippets of the fleur-de-lis are inserted below. Is she French? Algerian, perhaps? He looks familiar but lacks a name. Should we know who he is? A Morning in Paris was launched on the 23rd of February 1997 in Carnegie Hall in New York City, 34 years after it was recorded and well after the death of the man in the photograph. The woman, South African-born Satima B. Benjamin, celebrated the rediscovery of the tapes from her studio session in Paris in 1963. Finally, she had proof of her first personal encounter with a man whose music she had come to know among passionate jazz fans and performers in Cape Town in the mid to late 1950s. 
Though he had never traveled to South Africa in person, the young woman felt she already knew him because she had worked so intensely with his music through close listening to records, seeing him on the movie screen, and hearing his music played by local musicians. He was the jazz composer, arranger, and pianist Duke Ellington. His was the other face in the photograph. A Morning in Paris is a compelling piece of the larger story told through Sachin's life of how American jazz traveled to South Africa in the 20th century and was imaginatively incorporated into the lives of many South Africans in the post-Second World War era. The story is told from the perspective of Satima and her musical peers, all men, inside South Africa, but also she has traveled from South Africa to Europe, Brazil, Mozambique, Australia, and the United States over the last 50 years. Satima was a woman who felt called to jazz, a music claimed as America's classical music, though she never thought of herself as American. Her childhood and young adult memories were situated in and shaped by her family history, the city of Cape Town, where she was raised, and the people who nurtured the qualities of courage, strength, and love that characterized her approach to life and to jazz itself. She describes a formative period in Cape Town where she began to find a place for herself in the world through the books she read, books about the struggles in society of Africans in America, who were called both colored and Negro. One story in particular, that of Billie Holiday, a woman and a singer of mixed racial heritage also called Colored, was particularly important. She began to hear Holiday's voice on records owned by members of an international community of jazz fans who participated in the local jazz scene in Cape Town, and she moved toward the music of Duke Ellington. Okay, so that was actually Satana play, singing with Duke Ellington on piano, mm -hmm. very unusual moment. Um, I do believe that the, he had, has never accompanied singers on record before. Um, and he wanted to play it because he asked if she knew Solitude and she said she did. And then she, he, she sang it in a key he didn't know. Um, so he had to kind of figure it out first. Um, the, the pizzicato violin is actually by a Danish violinist whose name has escaped me right now, which is ridiculous, but there we go. Um, and the, the um, bass player um, and um, drummer are two South Africans, Makai Ntrogo and Johnny Gaster. Um, it would normally have been her husband, um, Abdullah Ibrahim, who would have accompanied her, but when she started to sing, I got it bad and bad and good, Duke Ellington ran out of the recording studio and said, I want to play. And then he did solitude with her too. This was in 1963, she was 23 years old. If you imagine
Indian and African singer, you may be surprised at what you hear as you listen to Satana singing in my solitude. You may initially have difficulty placing her. This was her struggle with the anti-apartheid movement abroad when she went into exile in the 1980s, though her experience in the United States has not been, was not that different. One prominent African-American jazz musician dismissed her for a few years a few years back saying she couldn't possibly come from South Africa she sang jazz in the way that she did. She surely must be from the Midwest or something. When she and other South Africans traveled and performed in Europe in the 1960s and 70s, there was the same lack of recognition. Seeing her in person, they struggled to match her skin and hair with the stereotype of a real black South African. They simply expected a more African sound or a darker complexion, perhaps the voice of Miriam Makeba, for example. And yet, Sartanus is a characteristically South African musical story. And what I'm going to do now is actually just work through a quick PowerPoint of some images, um, just to, to talk to you a little bit about her. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, I'm sorry, we can just keep moving on. Sorry. Okay, so I, what I have done, um, actually we published this book together. Um, I've divided her life essentially into four periods. The formative period is her early childhood and young adult life in Cape Town. They left, so she was born in 1936, she left in 1962. Then there's a period of what we call jazz migrancy, where for, for about 15 years she and Abdullah, her musical partner and eventually husband, um, basically just moved all the time. They never settled in a single place. He had a gig at a, at a club in Zurich for three months a year, and then they had to sort of make their way the rest of the time. They traveled between Southern Africa, went to Australia, they went all over, quite literally, in search of work. Um, they did, did go back to South Africa until, the 19, until 1976 with the Soweto uprising, and then they decided um, to leave the country for good, and it was at that moment they went into exile. They openly declared their support for the anti-apartheid movement and against the, the apartheid regime, um, and they lost passports, etc., etc. So there's the jazz migrancy period. They go into exile. They live in New York City. It's when Satima starts her own record company. It's called Ekapa, which means Atoll from, from the Cape. And then, of course, in the 1990s, there, with the release of Mandela and the move towards the democratic dispensation, all those who were in exile were allowed to return home. Um, she didn't go back immediately, but her husband did. So it is this issue, the question of do you return home and how do you do it, is the fourth period of her life. So I'm just going to work through some of the things. You're going to see, uh, um, so this is actually a, just obviously a birth picture. She is from St. Helena. It's an island on, in the Atlantic Ocean. That's where half her family came from. Her mother's, that's her father's family. Her mother's family were probably um, pros pros prospectors in the diamond mines of Kimberley, where the big hold is. They were from the Philippines. So she's not, she's a, she's a real mix of um, people. And her name, Sartam, is actually not a Muslim name, though they did convert to Islam um, in the late 1960s. She, for a period of time, Abdullah has stayed, converted. Um, Satima means the one who listens, and it was given to her by a very, very exceptionally talented bass player, Johnny Johnny, who went into exile with them, and, and she took care of him, and he gave her this name, Satima, and she just liked it, so she, she adopted it as her full-on name. This just gives you a few images of the kinds of, that is her family, you can see the complete range of racial identification. She's a woman classified in South Africa as colored, and I want, I'm going to show you a video clip where they talk about what that means. It basically means you're mixed of some color. It doesn't mean you are black African, and it doesn't mean what colored means in the United States. Radio was very important in her grandmother's home. Ma Benjamin was her grandmother. She was, she had, she was taken in by her grandmother when she was very young. And then you see there the Bioscope, which is the cinema, very, very big influence. She went every single weekend to the bioscope and, and heard American musicals. That's where she sang her first songs on stage. She closed her eyes and her knees rattled, right? Um, another big influence were ballroom dancing. So um, they were ja that's where a lot of the jazz musicians came out of these dance band experiences. Um, the one on the top actually was her boyfriend, Jimmy Adams. He was a saxophone player. Um, he loved her to the day he died. He told me to tell him that when I interviewed him. So this just gives you some sense. He was married with a bunch of children, but he told me it had to be told that he loved her to the day he died. 
Um, here's the story of Billie Holiday, and you can see even the visual I've written about the visual representation and the lack likeness of Satana singing on the far right and over here, and then Billie Holiday in the middle. But it was the sound of Billie Holiday's voice that called her to Billie Holiday, the way in which she conveyed emotion. It wasn't a big, technically big voice like Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughan. It was a, a voice of a woman, and, and her story told the story of her life. And in there she was called a colored woman, C-O-L-O-R-E-D. In South Africa, it was C O L O U R E D, like the British way, but they and they distinguished between coloreds and Negroes, and of course there was that distinction in apartheid in South Africa too. So she she did identify with this book. She read it just before it was banned in South Africa. Um, this just gives you some sense of the other influences. So there were these nightclubs where um, they could sing, but they had to sit in the kitchen, just like Billy Holiday had to, right? They couldn't come out. They were white nightclubs. They could sing, but they couldn't participate. And then the, another big influence with these traveling um, variety and jazz shows, there wasn't much jazz, mostly variety. There were white impresarios, largely Jewish, who saw African talent and wanted to come kind of showcase it and took people on the road. In fact, this is a group called the Golden City, i.e. Johannesburg, the Golden City Dixie. So you can see all the irony of it. They, were, they traveled abroad <laughs> and then this is them actually landing Back home. Of course, this was a way for a lot of people to leave the country too, so a lot of them never came. Here's the jazz migrancy period. This is Sasha starting to sing more. She never was at the forefront, though. It was never her gig, not right up until they moved to New York. This is the recording with Duke Ellington, the morning in Paris one. This is just some images. That's her husband, Abdul Ibrahim. That's the day they got married. She said he was very drunk. And that's in Central Park with their dog boots. And we used to have a dog boot too when I grew up. It was very interesting. You know, just some images of it. And of course, again, with Duke Ellington there. Um, come on, let's go. Why isn't that moving? Oh, wrong arrow. <laughs> OK. Um, so this is the period of exile. It's after the Soweto uprising when the children were massacred. She said, I've got children. I don't want them growing up in this environment. She may not do to go back to New York. He never, ever wanted to really live there. But they went and they lived in the Chelsea Hotel, which, of course, if anybody knows the history of New York, that's where Bob Dylan, a whole lot of artists and poets and important people have lived. She lived there for 30 years. Here is the Hotel of Chelsea. This is her actually singing in Mozambique. She went to the... Um, Representing the African National Congress in exile, she went to the, um, the, the celebration of liberation of Mozambique, very formative moment for her. These are her children, um, Sakwe and Sidi. Um, that's them just growing up. Um, and so as she get, she then came to settle in New York City, she, she formed her own record label. These are just some of her recordings, another bit here, and then... Um, this is the what she was basically doing in New York and for the time. This is her daughter, actually, Jean Grey, or C.D. Ibrahim. If you get on YouTube, you'll find a ton of stuff with her. She's kind of an underground hip-hop musician. Um, really powerful, um, really powerful, actually. She, she travels the world as a hip-hop artist. Um, and those are just, I'll talk a little bit about the Cape Town Love um, album, but, or CD, but this just gives you some sense of her life in New York City. Like many of her generations, after honing her vocal skills on white English and American girl singers of the 40s, Sartima borrowed American-made jazz as a musical home in the late 50s because it provided a space for the individual voice in a collective fabric, for expressive freedom, and for her growing political consciousness of the plight of people of color in South Africa and the world at large. I say borrowed. Because for Sartima, the community she inhabited in the 40s and 50s, popular music, swing bands, the music of Ellington, and the more experimental jazz world were the acoustical discourses completely naturalized through radio, film, sound recordings, and live renditions of the American derived repertory. From the late 50s, Benjamin applied the principles of jazz performance to a peculiarly South African songbook, songs that intermingled in her home and community drawn from local renditions of British music hall, American Tin Pan Alley, and increasingly her own compositions. This complicated identity of much music making in 20th century South African popular music and jazz performance is poignantly articulated in her long-playing record, LP, you know what those are, Memories and Dreams from 1983, her third recording on the Okapa label. Side A contains three original compositions in her Liberation Suite, 
um, which goes back to the Freedom Now suite of um, Abby Lincoln and Max Roach, and they actually knew each other. So there are some really interesting diasporic musical and political connections. Anyway, on the side A is a track uh, is, is this um, original composition, Nations in Me, New Nation Are Coming. She's a mixed woman of mixed race, so she sings positively about a being of mixed race. Whereas the apartheid regime at the time was saying if you're mixed race, you're impure and bad, and you need to be sort of banished out of white areas. Which a lot of people argue that the reason for the group areas act in fact was to get rid of the people of mixed race, to get rid of that history of white mixing. Okay, so she has nations in me, new nation are coming, children of Soweto and Africa, a really deep diasporic kind of um, kind of almost an anthem. Side B has four songs drawn from Hollywood musicals and jazz standards from the 40s popular in her youth. It's hard not to see her memories then as American and her dreams as her originals projecting forward to a new South African nation and society. Tensions between views of jazz and its ancestral repertories in or by South Africans as belonging versus being borrowed has plagued the composition, performance and reception of Sartana's music regardless of historical or physical location. Because she and others left South Africa in the early 60s, her story is not always remembered or recognized in contemporary South Africa. In reality, much of her energy in, in exile in the United States from the 70s on was spent trying to help the larger jazz world see the connections between the pasts in jazz from a US perspective and those from its distant musical kin in the southernmost part of the African continent. And in fact, each of her recordings is a little piece of that story where she tells another angle of the story. So Southern Touch is one of them, and it's, there she goes back to some of the early music of W.C. Handy, and she tells the story of, of, of the Southern Touch of the Southern part of the United States and the Southern Touch of South Africa. And there's a touch of kindness and people who paid their dues, and, and she connects and so she sings this music with such respect for the composers. It's really quite moving and beautiful. Um, proving legit legitimate membership of an African diaspora constituency has been a part of that struggle. Satima B. Benjamin's voice is always a voice that is in exile. Over the years she has wrestled with the lack of a clear sense of place in the world of jazz. As a result, each of her recording projects and the words she spun around them told a piece of her story. And in many ways, our work together over a 20-year 20 period was um, a response to this persistent confusion and listeners and musicians expressed in terms of who she was, where she came from, and what she chose to sing. She would sing a lot of love songs because she really believed that the future of South Africa was about loving each other, but because she sang love songs, it wasn't she didn't mean it love between a man and a woman, she wanted to sing about the power of love, and people were in the anti-apartheid movement would get very angry with why are you singing about love when you should be singing about politics? But for her, that was politics. And she was a woman and a mother, and she wanted to sing, which is quite traditional, wanted to sing um, about those kinds of things. So what I'm going to play for you now is about, um, it's about an eight-minute clip. But, but, and, and let me just explain to you why I'm showing you movies instead of reading everything from the page. I've done lots of writing. But um, when the book that Sutton and I put together and that was published a few years ago, um, it's called Musical Echoes. We are into the idea of call and response. Um, we signed the contract together. Satima, it is as if Satima is a co-author, though she wrote very little in that book. But the way I see it is we spent 20 years in conversation. The ideas that she grew herself were ideas she shared very freely with me. My world, my understanding of South African jazz was infinitely shaped, I mean, I'm just unbelievably shaped by um, what she told me, what, the way she thought, what her experiences had been. So I'm trying, in a sense, to give you some sense of her voice. This film actually was made by an um, anthropologist, also from St. Helena, the island of St. but who lives in Toronto, which is Dan Yon, he's at York University. Um, and it was really, he was interested in her because she came from St. Helena. So, um, the, and actually the start of the film, start, it starts off on the island of, of St. Helena, but it mostly moves between Cape Town and New York. So I'm going to show you a small clip which focus on, focuses on her song, Musical Echoes, which is going to be the substance of what I talk about now from, from here on out. But what I want you to get is a sense of 
not my voice over of Satma's ideas, but rather that you hear her voice talking. In the reviews of the book, people have said, Mother just dominates the voice, okay? <laughs> which is a little unfair, uh, I think. Um, we tell Satma's story, we don't tell my story, and she's singing, you must listen to her music. That's what her mission is. I think if she could have, she would have written her own book, it didn't happen. So our partnership was productive for her, and the book came out before she died. She died unexpectedly in August. So I'm going to play this for you because it speaks to the issue of musical echoes, it speaks to issues of diaspora, of the struggle for identity, but also the complexity of mixed racial identity. I want you to have some understanding what that is because, in a way, jazz is the perfect language for mixedness. Um, and it spoke to her in many kinds of ways as a woman struggling to find a place, particularly as the apartheid regime kind of clamped down on people who were mixed and sort of, in a sense, un unidentifiable, unclassifiable, unplaceable. So everybody got lumped into the category of Cape Colored. It didn't matter where you came from, what your history was. You were totally denied any sense of family history. So I'm going to just um, play this for you now. Colored. 
I'm not. I'm a mixed Santonian. That's that's what it says on my birth certificate. That's what I have. And he says, listen, there's no more such a thing as a mixed Santonian or Cape Miller. There's no, there's only Cape Collard from now on. And she didn't sign that thing, and I signed it for her. It's the first time I ever saw her cry. It's the first time I ever saw her walk away from something, because she would walk into things. And it broke her heart. Um, I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, I went back there to that street, Sussex Street, Claremont. But you know, it's uh, when the group areas, that whole thing, when South Africa changed, it's so sad for me, because the house is still there, but it's a whole different changed house, uh, because it's, it became a white area. That's terrible. It's changed so much that it has been a long time, very long time. But those memories of this road, never believe me, because they far outweigh the, the trauma that we went through before we moved here. It's just those things, and that's why Satima is so dear to me. I have other sisters and brothers, we also close. But those memories of this road, you believe me. Oh, I'm so thrilled. in a colored area. We went to colored schools. We, and that's the way it was. And she would always say, know your place and keep your place. And I always wondered, what is over there with the white people that I'm not supposed to know? I, 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 the only white people I saw was when they were listening in the club, in the white nightclub, and we couldn't mix with them. And I really couldn't figure out what it was until I got to Europe and I found out, but there's nothing that I want from. <laughs> <laughs> they want something from us, but it took years for that, you know, to come to me and say, oh my goodness, I thought, oh, when I'm going to Europe, I'm going to find out what it is. Okay, so when we used to go to um, Bioscope, that's what we call, we didn't call it the movies or the cinemas, the Bioscope. By soap, we went. We would be sitting there, they would have talent contests from time to time. So I sang, um, what was the first song? And I, and I went and I said to Joan, what, what do I have to sing? She said, sing, I wonder who's kissing him now. Because it was a popular song at the moment. And I, I just would get up and say, I wonder who's kissing him now. I don't even know the second line, but anyway, that's the song. <laughs> I think we all start out imitating somebody from here. And in my case, too, I listened to the BBC, so I heard Berlin and I heard Crazy Field. I, I think I was about 18 now. So I packed up and I left Mom Benjamin, and I went to live in Kew Town at Lowe, and Joan and myself was my mom. And that's when I discovered there was a piano there and that my mother could play sort of like a syncopation. She could play by ear. And white opposite and downstairs was a, a public library. Okay, and that's where she, she found the book of Billie Holiday. And then she it there. So in 2002, several years after receiving the words and melody of musical echoes in the dream, Sartima traveled from New York City to Cape Town to record the song and produce a CD of the same name. Her trio included the American Stephen Scott on piano and South Africans Lulu Gonzana on drums and Basil Moses on bass. But all Sartima, Lulu and Basil have now died. The photographer and person, and person who conceived of the visual dimensions of the project was George Hallett, one of Cape Town's most famous photographers of the apartheid and post era. 
I mentioned him here because after I met him in Cape Town in July 2013, I discovered that though he is credited on the CD as the photographer, his work as artistic director and the person who covered the costs of the photo shoot has, has never been satisfactory to acknowledge. He was quite, quite upset, actually, so I promised him every time I talk about it, I will say George Hallett is the person who put the CD together. Well, well, yes. Here I have borrowed, um, um, in talking about the musical echo, I have borrowed Southam's notion of the musical echo for reflecting on the possibilities um, the echo offers to music scholars for thinking about jazz and popular music as globally distributed forms in the 21st century. So now we've looked at the personal story. Satima sees her life and her music as a kind of musical echo, as a kind of call and response between American jazz and the South African experience, and some kind of connection between the two. So now we're saying that that one life can do that, does it have some sort of wider resonance for the ways in which we think about jazz and popular music studies as global phenomenon in this 20th century. The photograph on the cover of Musical Echoes portrays Satima at home, alone at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean in Cape Town as the sun begins to rise. Satima's name and the disc title are italicized silver lines in the clouds. The trio has no visual counterpart, but their names are inscribed on the right side of the image. Of the image. This is beautiful. Yeah, come on. Um, Satima stands to the left of the frame, facing right, staring out into the expansiveness of the ocean, an ocean that connects her to the Americas, her other home. Her hands are clasped at her breast, layers of white chiffon envelop her small frame, and an opaque shawl hugs her upper torso. She is barefoot on freshly washed white sand. A profound feeling of solitude, of deep reflection at the dawn of a new day pervades the image. The tide is low, long, languid waves gently ever flow. The echoes, the, though the water is tinged with blue, there are no other signs of turmoil, pain, or struggle. The echoes of the ocean caress the ears, the wisps of an early morning breeze touch lightly without disturbing the peace. She knows where she is, but the usual topographical or tourist markers do not appear in the image. There is no close-up of the level top of Table Mountain with Devil's Peak on the right, the cableway lining the mountain slope, no view from Loberg Strand, the Table Bay, Bay view, or the site of the Twelve Apostles. In Satima's photograph, there's a feeling that the scene could be of any coastline in the world. Ambiguity prevails. Here the local and personally significant merge with the universally familiar. So too does Satima's voice elide into the globally constituted world of jazz. In fact, her standing at the edge of the ocean reminds one of Satima's approach to jazz and to life itself. She is the romantic, the woman who privileges the natural and the unprocessed but subtle in her sound. The viewer has no inkling of the intrusions of the noises of modernity, the bustle of the city, or the emotional stresses of everyday life. Rather, the solitariness of the moment gives her the space to let her heart and mind roam freely, to imagine, remember, dream, envision, and return to the sounds of her childhood. Family visits to the beach, the movies, the sounds of radio and record, live and mediated, copies and originals, on stage and in the street. As she revisits the echoes of sound she has carried inside for so long, the real and the remembered merge. It is this singularity captured in the photographic moment, a coming full circle, uniting past and present, home and elsewhere, which ultimately heals. The absence of the mass mediated stands in stark contrast to the first echoes of the British and American originating music Satin and Grace, as her own came out of as, as her own came out of her grandmother's radio from audio recordings, the soundtracks of Hollywood film, and especially the musicals that were so popular in Cape Town during her childhood. Such technologies brought the music that shaped new communities locally. They certainly stimulated individual imaginings of a host of musical forms and constituencies, indigenous and imported, and sometimes enabled those who moved away to retain memory. South African jazz and popular music and Satima's place in the history of that music are two outcomes of that process. Sassima coined a variety of terms to demonstrate her place in, these, in those processes. The musical echo was the last configuration in her lifetime. What does Sassima allude to when she invokes the musical echo? What makes the idea of the musical echo a resonant metaphor in Sassima's story about South African jazz, both at home and abroad? Acoustically, an echo is simply defined as the repetition or imitation of a sound emanating from a source. Visually, one represents this phenomenon 
as an acoustical signal in the center of ever widening circles or waves of repeating sound. The image is useful for representing the idea that a source sound in a resonant space can echo back. But it is less helpful for communicating ways in which an original sound or the resonances of the original might be transformed at any point on the resonating wave. In other words, in relation to the original sound, the echo is conventionally viewed as something hollow or failing. It abides by a currency of diminishing returns and is dismissed as mere repetition or imitation. In the canonical history of jazz, it is the Benjaminian aura of the original sound and not the echo, which has been valued by American musicians and historians. There's been little recognition that the copy could generate new possibilities of any real value elsewhere in the world. In a limited manner, this perspective began to shift when the original, live or recorded live, moments of jazz were distributed by the music industry worldwide. In this context, the echo, or copy of the original moment, accrued value as a commodity. Copies were mass-produced as musical objects and globally distributed for profit, a process that contributed to the global hegemony of the original moments of jazz and to the canonical histories written about those moments for Americans in the world market. While the owners of music industries relished the spread of jazz for the profits they reaped, until recently, jazz historians and consumers in the United States tended to remain closed to the effect that traveling commodities might have had on local communities. Starting this story suggests, however, that by tracing how these commodities travel the world, one gains a capacity to see the echo or copy of the original sound from a new perspective. This idea is illustrated in the commonly used dictionary definition of the echo, the persistence of a sound after its source has stopped, which introduces this idea of a time lag, of temporal displacement, but also perhaps of fashion and its consequences, or indeed of the capitalist notion of uneven development in the so-called third world. In this reading, each repetition of the initial sound makes contact with an ever-widening circle of possibilities. Imagine, for example, how complex the story of Duke Ellington's Black, Brown and Beige would become if we track the, track the routes traveled by several copies of the recording simultaneously. One goes to London, one to Tokyo, another to Brisbane, a fourth to Moscow, one to Venice, one to Hamburg, and the, and the last goes all the way to Cape Town, South Africa. Assuming each record is bought in each of these places, one quickly realizes that the original takes on a life of its own once it leaves the shores of the United States. Each gains what Arjun Apadurai calls a social life, and the lifespan of the echo will extend from being a single transient moment in time and place to occurring over a period of time and encompassing a certain distance. And in the hands of musicians in local communities, the recorded echo would soon begin to generate its own sound. While they might have some audible connection to the original lineage, it would no longer sound the same. Echo location embodies this principle. It is defined as a sensory system found among animals, including bats and dolphins, in which high-pitched sounds are sent out so that their echoes can be used to determine the direction and distance of objects. In other words, the reverberation of the acoustical echo maps distance via sonic signal. With its return comes the capacity to measure proximity. In this sense, echo location signals the pressure to constantly evaluate the relationship between parts in space and time and displaces the hegemony of the original sound at the center. Setting the echo in motion opens up the rhetorical space for those who heard American originating jazz and popular music as it traveled the airwaves and embraced and transformed it to fit local sensibilities. For many living beyond the United States, the music that echoed out from the United States generated points of contact and realized new relationships at a variety of places on the acoustical landscape. Through the echoes of sound produced elsewhere and translated locally as exact recorded repetitions, entire communities absorbed, reenacted, and mastered foreign repertory and style. In other words, I believe that at, at its core, the echo conveys the qualities of and bears strong resemblance to the diasporic, even exiled subject. The echo articulates spatial, temporal, and cultural displacement, which is frequently accompanied by a discourse of loss and suffering. The echo may also reference individuals and communities on the move in search of upward social mobility, people who nevertheless inhabit two or more spaces simultaneously. Living in one place, 
They continually exist in reference to vivid memories of and imaginings about con imaginings of continuing relationships with another. This is how I, I have defined new or contemporary forms of African diaspora. I actually have a, a last little section, but I want to see if there's still time for me to do it. Do you want to just talk? I'm happy to go either way. Keep going? Okay. The echoes of jazz and the reinstatement of beauty. My final reflections on the appropriateness of the musical echo for articulating Sartre's story come from perhaps an unlikely place. The writings of the literary scholar Elaine Scarry on the work of beauty as a project of social justice contained in her two essays on beauty and being just it, from 1999. Underline Scarry's argument for restoring a central aesthetic place to beauty is the idea that beauty calls out to her viewers drawing them into her space and inspiring them to constitute similar acts and forms of beauty, to seek out unconventional figures and to protect other beautiful things from harm and destruction. Reading Scary several years ago, I was struck by how aptly she seemed to describe the call of jazz for Fatima. Beauty, Scary writes, brings copies of itself into being. It makes it, us draw it, take photographs of it and perform it and record it or describe it to other people. Sometimes it gives rise to exact replication, other times to resemblances, and still other times to things whose connection to the original site of inspiration is unrecognizable. The generation is unceasing. A similar sense of possibility was conveyed in the echoes of American-led music and jazz, specifically when they resonated outward from the United States to South Africa in the middle decades of the 20th century creating what Scary, in a similar context, calls a shared field of attention. Such a shared field is created when beautiful things and things in beautiful persons and things incite the desire to create, and that's a quote from Scary, so that there is the possibility of more than one beautiful object available to the viewer. You began by copying, by sounding just the same as Joni James or Ella Fitzgerald, such a record, but eventually you had to move away from that. Eventually you had to sound like yourself. No two singers are the same. Sounding like James or Fitzgerald, creating the copy, constituted the shared field of attention between South Africa and England or the United States, but it was only the beginning. Scary's writing about beauty constitutes an important intervention in restoring the work of beauty as a goal of aesthetic pleasure and a gesture, gesture of social justice in human experience. Her purpose, she writes, is to reinstate the value of beauty in a world in which beauty has become unhinged from notions about the sacred and the transcendent. And where staring at beautiful things and people in particular has come to be defined as action that violates the object of the gaze. She interrogates the current premises of such belief, reminding readers that the idea that the viewer holds power over the object and not the beautiful object over the viewer has emerged only relatively recently. Instead of bringing harm, Scary proposes that allowing beauty to transform may incite in the view of the urge to protect, to act on behalf of an object of beauty. Further, she argues, beauty exerts pressure, pressure on the distributional. That is, the view begins not only to care for the extraordinary and singular, but also to value objects of lesser beauty within a field of vision. In scary thinking, then, beauty is a calling. As one responds to beauty's invocation, one is decentered. A transformation then takes place at the very roots of our sensibility, she argues. Beautiful things, quote, act like small tears in the surface of the world that pull us through to some vaster space, or they form ladders reaching toward the beauty of the world, or they lift us, letting the ground rotate beneath us several inches. When we come back down to earth, we discover our perspective has changed. We exist in a new relationship to the world around us. In the face of beauty, we willingly cede our ground to the things that stand before us, and that's a quote from Scott. In other words, beauty provides an occasion, an occasion for unselfing, a process in which our consciousness is changed towards goodness and is read as a life-saving mechanism. An extreme form of pleasure accompanies the moments of decentering, moments that enrich the life of the viewer. The absence of beauty, Scary concludes, is a profound form of deprivation. Scary's invocation to reconsider, reconsider consider beauty, parallel ways in which Sartre and others perceived the power of American jazz in their lives and community in South Africa after the Second World War, on one hand, 
and the kind of alternative habitus constituted out of the sounds of the music and principles of jazz on the other. Even when beauty and justice are both in the world right scary, beauty performs a special service because it's available to sensory perception in a way that justice normally is not. In post-war South Africa, there was very little feeling of a just society for people of color, and it was almost impossible to defy the apartheid regime because of the threat of imprisonment, death, or exile. In this context, jazz becomes a means of imagining a path to freedom. Jazz conveyed the capacity to practice alternative ways of being in the world that would, by definition, Build on place principles of freedom of articulation, individual expression in the context of group support and improvisation. Particularly once she settled in New York City, Santana found that jazz became the vehicle for performing the work of beauty that's carrying both. As a mother, wife, political activist, and increasingly as a manager, composer, producer, and band leader, Santana has cre created one shared field of attention after another, tenderly opening up acoustical spaces for herself and for male musicians. In each of these spaces, she, she was driven to protect, to act on behalf of, and to require of herself and her musical companions to be decentered by the power of the sound and aesthetic sensibilities of jazz improvisation. In her mind, these sens sensibilities include spontaneity, love, tenderness, compassion, subtlety, nuances, and the revelation of the sound of inner human beauty. Her work began not in the corridor of, of institutions of high art, but in the safe corners of her home at the Chelsea Hotel, and in the anonymity and motion of the street, used to call it meditation in motion. Here she made her music by spinning moments of stillness in the midst of daily routines of childcare, cleaning, cooking, and serving. It was at these moments she insisted on keeping the music and the memory of its source and travel alive in her heart and imagination. These are the moments Nadia Serenitakis describes as points self-reflexive femininity. Performing and recording jazz renditions of old melodies with African-American musicians, Satma has long constituted a field of attention with transatlantic potential. At these moments, the histories of the old and the new African diasporas and other transcontinental connections between England, South Africa, St. Helena, and the United States become irrevocably intertwined. As she reintroduced songs from a long past long forgotten by the trio, but restored to their country of origin and newly made in, her, in each venue. Such performances created rare, beautiful things. Beautiful in themselves, but equally poignant in the face of a history of injustice, oppression, gender struggle, and forgetfulness. These were and continue to be radical and controversial ways of being for women of color. Nevertheless, these processes have a long history in Sartana's life. When she heard Billie Holiday's voice in songs, she knew she had found a musical place for herself in American jazz, with a voice that was distinctively her own in every way, from the peculiarity of her South African life experiences to the way in which she played with melody and timbre, the naturalness of its production, and the depth of feeling she poured into every note she uttered. This resonance heard and re-articulated by Satima opened up the possibilities for telling a new kind of story about traveling music in the 20th century, and certainly it is true for the 21st.
fertilization in your city. So with South African musicians, as I said to you, with the Liberation Suite, there is um, Max Roach's um, Free Freedom Now Suite. It has a, um, a, a piece of the suite that's called Johannesburg. So I think there's been a lot of dialogue, in, and Ingrid's work really beautifully um, works with this, um, between African Americans and South Africans. Um, the interesting though, thing, of course, is that it was slaves came mostly from West Africa. So the story is a slightly different story. Um, I think mostly musicians have gone to West Africa to rediscover their roots. Um, but there is interesting stuff that Abdul Ibrahim himself and his um, ex-husband. He is a real kind of character because, as we were talking about the toy song stuff, you know, he says, well, it's all very well to say that um, the samba comes from Brazil. He said, it comes from Angola, and it, Angolans came down into Cape Town too. So why don't you say that there's some impact of the berimbau, the musical bow from Angola that has come into Cape Town? Why can't we say that they're parallel histories? It's not just one history. So in a sense, we're decentering that too, is to say there are these really interesting strands, not just between the United States and South Africa, but it is the Atlantic Ocean that it circulates around. Um, there's very interesting stuff. I had a grad student who did work in Marseille, France, and Marseille opens up into North Africa. Um, so the, the, the Marseille, the people, the musicians in Marseille have connected into the free jazz of um, San Ra from Philadelphia, um, and they and he says he goes to Saturn and they say they're from Mars. <laughs> so you see, there's some really interesting plays with the play of, of identity and place and we, and, spa and space, because when people felt they didn't have place, they articulated in terms of space, so space out there, but space for ourselves here too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Nathan, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Have you noticed any ways in which uh, her music changed after the end of the part of that? question was if you notice ways in which your music had changed after a part of Well, um, I think she would say that every project she did, her voice was a little bit different, and her story is a little bit different. So the first thing she did after Mandela was released, she went back to Cape Town and did Cape Town Love. So that was a thing to say, I've had all this rich experience, I've got this recording experience, but the pianist who mentored me, Henry February, in Cape Town has never been recorded. So I want to go back and record with him. And then she picked a couple of the other musicians that one other the bass that she played with in the fifties as well. So it was in a sense that she wants to figure out how to return home with her issue. And she wanted to do it musically. And it took quite a long time for South Africa to invite her back. Ironically, she died in August. She had three major national forms of recognition in July and August. In fact, one came posthumously as being given to her, but she died before she could receive it. So there was a lovely thing towards the end, which made it feel like her death, which was a surprise for everybody. It wasn't quite as, as tragic, because she wanted to go home and recognize. Um, so she took these musicians, and she took the songs from the 50s, and she that they'd been played in the dance band, and, and for these musicians to suddenly play, not just sort of doing syncopation, so putting it on beat, but actually improvising, letting yourself go, and seeing where the music took you was a very, very exciting moment for them. And then, of course, on that um, compact disc, also done by George Hallett, are the, uh, un underneath the images of that compact disc are the images of the Khoisan, of Bushman's um, rock paintings from the Kaskana. So there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of harkening back right <coughs> to the origins of all musical performance and all uh, sort of ritual and performance. So, um, and then she did musical echoes too. She wanted to prove that there was this connection between South Africa and America, and in a way taking African American musicians back to South Africa and recording with them with South Africans. It was the proof of the moment of these connections because people simply didn't believe it. Yes, please. Uh, I'm interested in the connection between. Got involved with that and she said to me, I was 23 years old, I was terrified. 
and just left my country. She was terrified and she had, I was doing it, she felt an obligation. He invited her in, because apparently the story is that Duke said to him, then, he said to her, so are you married to him? When he said to her, are you planning to marry her? Well, he had a wife, sort of, that. Is that okay? And, um, um, well, I think he did, but they got divorced afterwards. I found all the documentation for it, so I know. Um, but he told her, Abdullah, he must marry her or he would lose her. And very, like, he then got all the documentation together and they got married about nine months later. But definitely he did want to work with her, but they didn't work that much because it's complicated when you have two male. <laughs> and Duke also he was known to have lots of women friends, right? So people can downplay the significance of anything, which is always what happens to us and the devil wasn't that important. That people deny that she even had recorded with him until these tapes got recovered in the, in, in the 1990s. And I, it's a wonderful story, I have to tell you, how those tapes got because it was a German engineer who had who was working for the American Armed Forces. He'd been captured in Nazi Germany and then, I think, freed by the Americans. So he was working as a sound recording engineer. It was Frank Sinatra's label. And Duke Ellington was the a &R man, and he could get five new musicians, new artists on his thing. And Sartre and I did a work with some of them. And um, this German engineer loved her voice. He fell in love with her voice, and he made double copies illegally. And it was the double copies that he kept. And then when David Hayden was doing Billy Strayhorn biography, he went over to France and he met Lena, who's still alive, I think. And, and he said, listen, there's this woman, I think she's in New York, and I've got these beautiful things. Can you give them to me? And he contacted her and she got it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an amazing story. Yeah, a really cool story. Mm. Yeah. Okay, one, yes, please. I'm just curious what happened to the original tapes. Why did they disappear? Um, uh, there's speculation about the mafia. There's all kinds of speculation. Who knows? We don't know. He, he had the copy. Now, I will tell you something interesting, too. I had a, I won't tell you who it was because I want to protect it a little bit, but I had a teacher when I was, uh, he was visiting at NYU, and he told me he had a cassette copy, or he gave me a cassette copy of the reel to reel of. Um, with Ellington. He gave it to me because I was working on it. just started working on it at that time and he told me not to tell her he had it. So I gave her a cassette of it that wasn't the original and then a few years later. So I never, t I honoured him but it, you feel these funny sorts of... So he got tapes and I don't know if it was a copy of a copy whether it was the original, I don't know. Yeah, it's, an, it's a really interesting question. It's all the bootlegging and all the skullduggery of <laughs> illegal things. Uh, and listening to jazz here, I feel totally differently than I do when I'm in, let's say, the jazz center in UKC and mm -hmm. uh, Durban. The, there's a vibrancy, it's as if that echo, I really like your idea about the echo because uh, the South Africans I know and love, they have listened to this jazz, but then when they do it themselves, they don't know what that difference is, but it's it's as if they're discovering it all over again. And it, it feels like it must have felt the bebop in the mm -hmm. in the forties, you know. Mm -hmm. It's got that energy to it. Mm -hmm. And and so I I so much appreciate the fact that that uh, they they in a sense they've preserved the jazz mm -hmm. in this uh, century mm -hmm. because they've created it anew. Well, and that we in invested it with traditional sound yeah, too. too. I mean, one of the pieces I was going to play is a piece where it's got what they call the Cape Town rhythm or the Kuma beat, and, and it, it, the, the carnivals, the minstrels, right, to do the New Year's Eve carnival, and the New Year's carnival, and that rhythm, the same musicians who are there are often playing in the dance bands and playing in the jazz bands, so it's it kind of, and they use the language of the, of the minstrel, so when they, they'll say, hubel up, which means walk, toughen up, up the hill, but actually tuba off is when, when you're playing in the band, right here, yeah, snap on the ground. So they use, use the discourse, the language is being used across different genres and different kinds of contexts. Um, and I think that there's all the move towards the hoisan stuff that we talked about the other day too. So some sort of sense of the deepness of musical origins, people are digging now to 
try and also bring it out and make it a positive thing. So yeah, I think there's very exciting stuff happening actually still in the South African Gallery. You'll each have an opportunity, if you wish, at the reception to have a, a brief conversation with Carol as well. But join me in thanking her. Mm -hmm. <laughs>